Here's a song very befitting of 2021's lockdown mood, Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City. But why do its harmonies conjure up such an unsettling vibe? And why is it therefore such a great song to learn to play on the piano? Hi, I'm Paul Wells from Plug and Plink. Shortly after this video, I'll be publishing my cover of the 1970s classic, Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City. And as usual, I'll make the shoot music available on paulwwells.com and I'll add the cover video to my YouTube playlist of rock song covers. Now, normally I just record the song and drop a few thoughts in the description and leave you to interpret my version however you like. This time I want to add more narrative, such as why I chose to cover the song in the first place, and reveal what I consider to be its most interesting musical features. The song, Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City, has come back to my mind while walking around central Milton Keynes during lockdown. It is quite stark how there is nobody present around these streets, normally teeming with a mix of office workers, shoppers and people socialising. I know this absenteeism wasn't the intended observation of the original song, which is a love song with the singer describing the effect of bereavement on the city as a whole caused by his lover's departure. But there certainly ain't no love in the heart of Milton Keynes now or probably around any other city for that matter at this time. The song was written in 1974 by Michael Price and Dan Walsh. It was first recorded by Bobby Bland and his version has a warm, bluesy sound to it. I'll admit I don't have any memories of the Bobby Bland version. I'm far more familiar with the Whitesnake version, which was released in 1978. Whitesnake performed the song at a significantly slower tempo than Bobby Bland, use a spacious vocal ambience and add an atmospheric analogue string synth which would have sounded quite novel in 1978. But apart from the overall change in the sound, Whitesnake made some musical alterations which make the song a better candidate for a piano cover. Whitesnake shifted from their original key of E minor to their preferred key of A minor. I've chosen to play the song in A minor and I have also pitched the sheet music in A minor. Shifting the key up to A minor lifts the melody high enough on the keyboard to be played with most of the accompaniment above the melody. The first difference concerns the relative positioning of this bass line E, G, A, C, A, G, which I'm going to call the pentatonic bass motif. In my arrangement, this appears in bar 4, then in bar 8, then in bar 12, etc., and is a significant component of the identity of the song. In the Bobby Bland version, the E and G are leading notes with the tonic A falling on the first beat of the bar. Personally, I find this positioning sounds too complete, ending unexpectedly early. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Whitesnake also introduced this adornment, D, E, G, C, played as a guitar melody. This melody chimes well on piano, and I have added E, G, C, E underneath it, just to give it a little bit more prominence. Time for a quick side note. A common problem with making piano covers is that a song composed of interwoven vocal and instrumental lines quickly becomes very blended and confused when all played on the one instrument at the same time. This blending becomes a real problem when most of the notes are located within the already heavily used two octave zone either side of middle C. So it is a gift that this song has both a repeating guitar melody and a pentatonic bass motif. These provide a strong demarcation between the instrumental ingredients of the song because they each use a separate region of the keyboard which makes it easier for the listener to unpack what is going on. There is one slight problem. As the chord shifts for the first time from A minor to D minor at bar 13, I cannot discreetly cover both the guitar and the vocal line because they occur at the same time and intrude on each other's space. 
So to keep the melody clear, I have to drop the guitar part while over D minor. The song is one repeating loop with no obvious verse or chorus to it. The loop is however made up of two clearly identifiable sections. The first section starts at bar 9, There Ain't No Love, and the second section starts at bar 25, Every Place That I Go. For my cover, I have chosen to play through the loop just twice, once to establish the vocal melody, just in case you haven't heard the song for a long time, and once using the shape of the song as the foundation on which to let rip with some ad-lib piano soloing. The first half of the loop has a distinctive, unsettling harmonic feature to it. At bar 9, the loop starts off with an A minor chord, bouncing off one other chord before returning back to A minor. The least offensive other chord the songwriter could have visited from an A minor start would have been perhaps D minor, F major, G major, or G major dominant 7th. What's noteworthy here is D minor, F major, or G dominant 7th all contain they all contain a natural F but the songwriters selected none of these safe choices instead we find the bounced off chord contains an eyebrow raising F sharp that results in D major or B minor however you want to think of it another example of these two chords is Aujourd'hui c'est toi Today it's you I'm talking, of course, about the spine-chilling monster of a TV theme tune, Panorama. It, too, switches between the same unsettling pair of chords. Next to A minor, the appearance of F sharp is ominous. It's a twinge of danger. It's a goblin. At bar 25, the lyrics go on to explain that now that you've gone, the sun don't shine. The harmony now takes a much more settling path with reassuringly familiar chords. A minor, C major, D minor, G minor, and then back to A minor. So we are led to conclude that the danger has passed, and all is going to remain calm through to the end of the loop. At bar 39, the loop rounds off with G major, F major, and then C major, and the lyrics are from the city hall to the county line. So now at bar 40, we have landed on C major, but we are left needing a pivot chord to take us from C major back to the start of the loop with A minor. The blandest choice of pivot chord back to the start of the loop would be something like a G major root position with a dominant 7th or maybe an E minor, E minor 7th. But that's not what we get. The goblin shows his face once more at this point and the B minor with its unsettling F sharp puts us back on edge, ready for the next time around the loop. The F sharp would sound out of place at this juncture had our ears not been preconditioned to expect it from many bars back. So, as I just said, it's a loop in my cover version. I traversed this loop twice. The first time around, which is from bar 9, I try to mimic the vocals. I try to get the piano to sing, making heavy use of grace notes. The piano won't let you bend notes like a guitar or a human voice, or trombone for that matter. So grace notes are the only trick up the piano player's sleeve for implying sliding between notes. I find the bass gains authenticity if you take an indirect, indirect path between the notes using grace notes. And if you look at my sheet music, you will find that a lot of the arrangement contain a high proportion of grace notes in the left hand. By bar 42, I have given up trying to make the piano sound like any other instrument, and I have switched to an unapologetically piano-oriented sound. The riff was introduced the first time around, and so now it's time to cash in on that groundwork. My left hand has mostly moved out of the range of the fretless bass and is now earning its money as chord maker, freeing up my right hand to dazzle a little bit. 
I've chosen to retain the pentatonic bass motif because that anchors the structure of the song so well but breaks up the right hand's performance into a series of more manageable breaks. My aim is to retain as much interest as I can by making each of the breaks as different as possible, a bit like walking through the city centre shopping mall and gazing briefly into each shop window in turn. So allow me to explain what there is in each of these shop windows, which build up to a climax which ultimately ties the whole song together. At bar 42, I'm turning up the rate of notes to announce, hey, I'm no longer playing the tune, this is now the piano solo. But I am only easing into the piano solo with some simple pentatonic fluttering. There are more interesting adornments to follow. At bar 46, I add a rattle on E and G, which feels like the fifth and the seventh of the A minor chord. This is an act of defiance, refusing to move from A minor, even though the chord in the left hand has actually shifted to D minor. I also feel that the rattle echoes the shivering cold of the city in the winter with a dusting of frost on the streets. I'm deliberately holding back at first in bar 49 before unleashing a splash of ultraviolet jazz flute in bar 50. In bars 53 and 54, I'm briefly going polyrhythmic, overlaying a bit of 3-4 as a guitarist would typically do to just add that extra push of angst. Well, we've had plenty of fast notes. We've had an excursion from the tonic chord. We've had a distortion of the timing. And we are entering the second half of the loop at bar 57. The harmony is simplified, so let's just reflect on a cautious return to normality, conforming to the chords and introducing a liberal quantity of grace notes, a much more relaxed section. Let's reuse that 3-4 timing and put the right hand into F major, defiant of the G in the left hand, resulting in an optimistic sounding G extended chord. Bar 69. Everything has been leading up to this point. Firstly, I pick up the polyrhythm again, smashing at the F major chord over the G note in the bass, packing the bass with grace notes, of course. Then finally, starting at bar 71, I use a descending melody. Starting on A, it punches its way all the way down through, ignoring everything else that's happening around it, and ending on B, which is the pivot chord, which is the goblin. And I hit it twice just for a bit more effect. So that's it. Job done. We've been around the loop twice, but there is one last musical feature for me to point out. At bar 73, we need to pull the song to a close now. We cannot end on the goblin, and if we're not careful, we'll get just pulled back into playing the whole loop again. There's a lot of empty offices and shopping malls in the city centre, so I hold down the sustain pedal and let the piano produce this washy sound, letting the chords just mingle and merge into each other. And this mimics the echo you find in a large deserted building. So I let the timing relax, complete the pentatonic bass riff one last time, and then finally finish on the lowest note on the piano, which is like a gong of a kind. Well, I hope you enjoyed this preamble video, and I hope you find the main cover video just that little bit more engaging. Now you know what's going on inside my head while I'm playing. If you think this type of preamble video is a good idea, then do let me know in the comments section, and I'll perhaps make the preamble video a fixture for all of my cover videos from now on. If you're wondering why this preamble video is a separate video and not just prepended to the cover video itself, it's because a lot of people like to listen to my playlists, so I want to keep my playlists as uninterrupted as possible. Anyway, Thanks for watching. The most important thing about music is what it sounds like.